our work uh, is uh, primarily and solely on, uh, on animal models, so mice, uh, and, uh, and that's what I will show you. Our lab really works uh, on a variety of different uh, brain injury models uh, that span from uh, traumatic brain injury to therapeutic brain irradiation. But we also have this, this, uh, this long time uh, um, grant with NASA where we have been studying the effect of deep space uh, travel. I am located here uh, locally at the uh, at UCSF, moving soon to the new wild building. And uh, so I will move uh, a little farther from the ISS uh, and uh, start to talk to the journey that we are uh, facing, the journey to Mars. As you may know, the plan is to go back to the moon in uh, 2024 and from there take us uh, an exercise for then the longer journey to Mars that will occur in the 2030. And um, on that long journey, there are several obstacles that astronauts will face. One of which is the absence of gravity and we will touch upon a little bit, but there are also other um, obstacles. There are engineering challenges. There is physical and social isolation. The trip will, uh, will last uh, three years. It will take 18 months about to get to Mars and back and forth will be three years. Astronauts will be isolated, will be far from Earth. From the ISS now, they can communicate constantly. They can lose contact from there. There is absence of gravity, and there is another uh, major uh, hazard, which is the exposure to galactic cosmic ray. And we will talk about this uh, more extensively in the next 20 minutes, because that's what we've been working uh, um, for the past several years. And, uh, and only now, and I will tie it up on the back, at the end of the talk, we are actually wrapping up several stressors together. And so what are the galactic cosmic ray? Um, galactic cosmic ray are composed of uh, protons and highly charged nuclei that comes both from inside our solar system, but also from outside exposure, uh, explosion of the supernova, for instance. They are highly penetrating they penetrate the spacecraft, the human body, and they can lead to physiological changes. Why we are not uh, affected in the Earth? Because we are protected by the magnetic shield, and uh, the same also the astronauts, on, the astronauts on the ISS are protected by the magnetic shield of the Earth. Um, but as soon as we, we go into deep space, uh, there are there is deep exposure to the to the galactic cosmic ray that are far different from the radiation that is used in Earth with therapeutic radiation, both in type of energy because they are high energy transfer compared to the gamma radiation that we that we use therapeutically, but also on the dose rate that those are given. Unfortunately, there is no uh, human studies to understand the consequences of this exposure because, as I said, in the ISS, mo most of the data that we have are from astronauts on the ISS, but in the ISS, the astronauts are protected from the um, galactic cosmic ray. We have lots uh, of, uh, of uh, fiction about space travel, but we really don't have uh, actual human data. And so there is uh, uh, a lot of work that has been done with animals, but how do we study galactic cosmic ray that are only in the deep space in Earth? Well, we are lucky in the United States, there is a Brookhaven National Laboratory in Long Island in New York, where there are several accelerators that you can see here, where they can uh, replicate uh, some of the ions that are found uh, in space. So to give you an idea, it has been calculated that in deep space, uh, in astronauts, uh, or uh, in, 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 in average, uh, every cell of, of an astronaut will be transversed by a proton, once every three days, because protons are the most abundant composition of the galactic cosmic ray. By helium, once every uh, three weeks is the second more, most uh, uh, abundant uh, ions in the, in the spectrum. And then high heavy ions once every three months. So now if you do this calculation, you put it together in a longer mission that lasts three years, uh, um, there is the possibility for, uh, for an effect on the central nervous system that we need to understand. And so we use the Brookhaven National Laboratory to irradiate rodents. And actually over there, also cells can be irradiated. 
if they want. And uh, we use a composition that, uh, um, th this is a very, very new composition that has been uh, planned by NASA, by the physicists at NASA, that is composed by 35% uh, of proton, silicon, helium, oxygen, iron, and then is followed again by protons. By no means can replicate uh, 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 faithfully what is seen in space. It is a simulation with lots of uh, limitation, right? But at least uh, it's the first system that, uh, that now allow us to study a combination of galactic cosmic ray on the, cent on, on the body and for us in the, in the central nervous system. So what I will throw, what I will cover will be our recent data on the sex dimorphism response to galactic cosmic ray simulation. I will also talk about some countermeasures to prevent, and this is already a spoiler, some effect that we see after exposure to galactic cosmic ray. But most importantly, what we are interested in is to find biomarkers that can be predictive for cognitive decrements. Because what we need to know, our work, can you really be translated? We need to find um, biomarkers that then can be easily translatable also um, to astronauts. And if we can find an easy biomarker that can be measured also in astronauts will be very helpful. So the mice get uh, irradiated at Brookhaven National Laboratory. They get then here at UCSF. So they go across the country. They also undergo through a, a long uh, trip uh, similar to the astronauts. <clears throat> so the study outline is, is the follow. We use both male and female and we give uh, this uh, uh, a small radiation of galactic cosmic ray stimulation. Shortly after, or as soon as they arrive at UCSF, we, uh, uh, we get blood from them to measure uh, uh, blood profiling cells. And then uh, we wait several months, uh, and uh, about from one month and a half to three to uh, five months, we, did a, we do a variety of cognitive and behavioral tests to assess uh, anxiety level, uh, memory, uh, spatial memory, sociability, and uh, social memory. And I won't get into details of this. We do a lot of different tests to assess if uh, and, uh, the galactic cosmic ray affects different domain of the cognitive uh, realm. And then in the end, uh, we harvest the brain and we look uh, for uh, changes in the brain, the synapses, and changes in immune cells, because we are particularly interested in studying immune cells in the brain, which are the microglial cells. And so uh, we use a variety of, of tests, uh, as I've said, uh, because uh, our lab is really intended to understand uh, what happened to the brain when we lose the ability to be who we are. And, uh, and here is just uh, an example for you to, to have a good laugh. One of those tests that I will cover today for a matter of time is the radial arm water maze. This is a special learning and memory task. And so this is a top-down view of a radial arm uh, maze with eight arms. And uh, there is a, a opaque water. And under, under the, the water in one of the arms, there is an escape location. So when we put the mouse in the pool, uh, uh, the mouse doesn't like the water, so it keeps swimming. And then eventually we'll uh, find uh, the platform just randomly by, by chance. But when it's stand, it standing in the platform, it will look around. And around there are uh, cues that will allow the mouse to form a memory such that when we put the mouse again in the water, it will remember where the platform is and will swim to the platform right away. This is the same strategy, navigational strategy, that we use to navigate around us when we go to work, when we go to the grocery store, when we go to places where we are used to. We use the landscape around us that allows us to, to navigate, and so does the mouse. And so if we measure the number of errors that the mice make before finding the escape location, this is a measure of learning and memory. So I mentioned we did uh, different doses of, uh, of uh, the galactic cosmic ray simulation, 50 and 100 centigrade. And when we look in the male, we found that the 50 centigrade male, they made more errors compared to the sham animal and the 100 centigrade uh, male. When we look at female, we found that female did not uh, perform differently than the sham control. We have seen these also with different kinds of radiation and uh, with different uh, uh, tests, suggesting that the female in, in the cognitive domain were spared. Particularly, if we look at, the, as I said, the number of errors and the trials, we do three trials, we can see that the uh, zero gray or the, the controller male, they uh, learn and they impair the 50 centigrade males, they are impaired. 
And if we compare the males to the female, you can see that the female learn much uh, faster and much quicker. So those data demonstrate that there is a sex dimorphism response to the galactic cosmic ray simulation with only the male displaying deficits in this, in this specific special learning paradigm. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, difficult to say the future for this sp space travel might be uh, female. Of course, those are only related to one specific cognitive task. So there are many cognitive domain that needs to be addressed. But nonetheless, what if you're not a female and you want to go to space and you are worried about uh, developing some memory deficits? We got you covered. So um, we have long uh, studied uh, microglial cells. Microglia are innate immune system of the uh, brain, are the macrophages of the brain, that they are very highly motile cell. And they constantly survey the, the environment and they respond to tissue injury. And when there is an injury to the brain, they tend to clear up anything that is uh, abnormal. And oftentimes, if they became uh, abnormally activated, they also, in their clearing process, clearly clear abnormally synapses, for instance. And um, their chronic activation has been shown to be activated after irradiation. We have seen after different uh, form of irradiation. And we have previously shown uh, using oxygen only radiation that uh, the female also were spared from uh, uh, the effect of oxygen irradiation. In particular, we saw that uh, when we look at microglial cell, the female had no activation of microglial cell, whereas the male had a strong activation of those microglial cells. So we look on our male mice that I show you just the behavior, and we found in fact that they had a strong activation of several uh, lysosomal marker of uh, uh, microglial cell that shows when they are activated on their reactive state on their abnormal state where they shouldn't be on, on that state. Because now we are, um, if you remember, we took down the animals uh, five months after irradiation, right? And we find those uh, hangry micro microglia. And so this is not good. And uh, so what do we do? We wanted to test if we could reset this abnormal state of the microglial cells. How? Well, after they arrive back at UCSF, we put them very briefly for, a, for two weeks on a diet to completely deplete the microglial cell that were exposed to space radiation, right, in the brain. And then we let the microglia fully repopulate. So now we have new microglia in the brain. And then we test them, our normal testing. So you can see that this brief microglia depletion occurs uh, just as soon as they arrive at UCSF, whereas we test the animal three months later. And we found that in fact, those animals that receive a brief microglia depression and full repopulation three months earlier did not develop those memory deficits. We had seen a similar results by resetting the microglia activation and by depleting the microglia and letting the microglia repopulate, so resetting their activation system. We have seen previously that we can prevent also cognitive deficits after a different GCR uh, simulation. And when we look at those microglia marker that I showed you earlier, the lysosomal marker that were elevated in the irradiated mice, uh, those mice that uh, were uh, treated with the compound to deplete microglia and repopulate, those markers are not uh, uh, elevated. They are, they are comparable to the sham control, suggesting that uh, this treatment was able to uh, reset the activation of microglia. We then look also at synapses. We routinely look also at the synapses in the brain by the flow uh, synaptocytometry. And so we can isolate uh, by using the flow cytometry, we can isolate excitatory synapses by labeling pre and post synaptic marker with fluorescence marker. We, we pass through the cytometers and we, we measure them. And we saw that uh, after irradiation in the hippocampus, which is the brain region involved in the learning paradigm that I show you, there is an aberrant increase in synapses that is uh, um, normalized in the animal that were treated with the, with the, uh, the microglia depletion. So the uh, GCR simulation, galactic cosmic ray simulation exposure results in an aberrant increase in synapses that can be prevented uh, by microglia depletion and repopulation. And this aberrant synapse increase could be responsible for the memory deficits. Because when we have deficits, it could be because the synapses are not a check. And we can discuss that uh, later more in details. And uh, those the sex dimorphism of microglia 
uh, response in male and female had uh, also been when we, we published the first paper where we found that the female in space where their microbia was not activated was also during the time that uh, uh, two seminal paper came out showing that in fact uh, at resting stage the microglia in the female mice uh, is uh, in a in a protective state in an anti-inflammatory state that that suggests uh, the reason why the female might be protected and uh, um and like we can we can talk more about those, those those beautiful works that were just that came out in parallel when we published our first paper but justify why the microglia in the female may be more protective so I told you that we do a lot of behavior. I mentioned the learning and memory with the regular water maze. We also look at social behavior. Social behavior are essential because they are essential for us to engage in appropriate behaviors in meaningful relationship. And uh, we are socially uh, behaving, uh, uh, socially behaving species uh, like many mammals. Mice, like humans, are also socially uh, creatures, and they always uh, pursue a comfortable uh, and persistent and, and, and persistent uh, environment. And so we can measure actually sociability and social memory in mice. I wanted to show these slides because I think it's very fascinating. Often, if you don't do mice research, you think that they are not very useful for certain. Uh, things that pertain to humans, but um, in fact, they, they actually are. And so here is a top-down view of a, three, uh, of, a, of a chamber with three chambers that are separated by panels here, and they are opening. And here there is a little cage where inside is a mouse, and here is a little cage that is empty. And so this mouse is totally new and to the other mouse. So this is the test mouse we put in the center and we measure the time that the, the mouse spend with a new mouse that wants to, you know, you go to a party, you want to socialize versus uh, an empty cage so that we can determine if their ability to, social, so, to socialize. And here is the heat map that shows you how much the time the mouse spend with a, a, no, a novel mouse. Um, to make the long story short, we have previously shown that after oxygen exposure, my male mice are impaired on, on this social sociability task. But most interestingly, when we took down the, the animals and we look at the blood, we found that there was a strong correlation between uh, the performance on this social test and the presence of T cells in the blood, suggesting that T cells measured in the blood could be a predictive biomarkers for these social deficits. This was very exciting to us, but we wanted to move forward on these studies and look for a predictive biomarkers because this one, the blood, the T cells were measured at the time when uh, the animals was also tested, right? So we don't know if earlier on it could have been a predictive biomarkers. So we use now the blood profiling that we harvest as soon as the mice arrive and see if there was a correlation with their performance five months later. So when we look early on uh, on the blood profile, as soon as they arrive at UCSF, we found that there was an increase in monocytes in the blood, a significant increase in monocytes in the blood in, radi in irradiated ma male. But interestingly, when we correlate this against the performance in the regular water maze, where they are impaired, and I show you, we found a strong correlation, suggesting that uh, um, early measure of blood cells could be used also as a predictive biomarker for the development of later um, uh, cognitive deficits. So exposure to galactic cosmic ray uh, affects spatial learning in a dose and a sex dependent manner. A brief microglia depletion after the exposure to the GCR simulation prevent chronic learning deficits that are measured 90 plus day later. Acute peripheral immune cell correlate with the delayed behavioral changes and so can provide a suitable predictive biomarker for later deficits. I think in conclusion, we have been able to cement some of the essential role that microglia activation plays uh, in, uh, in memory in exposure of deep space. We have been able to possibly identify some therapeutic mitigation. And importantly, blood monocytes could be used as a, a predictive biomarkers. And importantly, it appears on those studies and others have also shown that there is a sex dimorphic response to GCR exposure. So I've to, what I told you is all about GCR exposure, but I started right 
telling you that on the way to Mars, uh, there are way more challenges. There are more complex GTCR, but there is absence of gravity and there is also social isolation. And so NASA recently was interesting, interested in really starting to dissect the role that all these, those different uh, uh, important stressors would play on the performance of an astronaut. Can an astronaut complete the mission to Mars? Can it come back? And how can it be affected? And how this translate to human, the, the animal study? So we were research, recently charged with a virtual end score or NASA Specialized Center for Research Grant, where we will be probing, probing the synergistic effects of radiation, altered gravity, and stress on behavioral and cognitive and sensory motor function to predict, to build a prediction model on performance decrements on astronauts. Our experimental design is very similar to the one that I've shown you earlier. We have radiation, we have uh, uh, the absence of gravity we mimic with hind limb loading, and we have also social isolation. And we will do the block profiling and a variety of tests, including some uh, uh, sensory test. And then uh, we will funnel all this large amount of data into a machine learning uh, um, uh, analysis uh, for hypothesis testing. I, of course, have a large group of people to thank, particularly all the studies that I have talked about were done by a talented uh, uh, person in the lab, Karen Krakowski, that now she started her own lab at the UC. Uh, Denver as an assistant professor, Katie Grew, my lab manager, but also my team member for the NASA VN score, April Ronca at NASA Ames, Larry Sanford at the uh, Eastern Virginia Medical College, and Adam Ferguson, which is here at UCSF, is our biostat that will help with all the machine learning for the upcoming studies. And so there is lots of people to thank. I have tried to give you some uh, insight of our research into deep space uh, and how we want to help and protect those astronauts. And I thank you all. Dr. Razi, I, I really, really want to thank you. Um, it was really interesting for me to hear you describe the differences in cognition, male to female, et cetera, because as you know, prior to just a month ago, there was a very different cap for female astronauts and for male astronauts in terms of time, time they could fly, which basically meant that no experienced female astronaut was going to be able to qualify for a Mars mission because they would have had built up too many hours before they got back. So that's now been leveled off. And I think your research supports that uh, to a certain extent. Do you um, have parts of your research that are going to be directed towards trying to quantify? Uh, I know it's quite a projection, but quantify what might be reasonable caps or if that, that time and space is even the right approach. Well, I think the, the, the caps for radiation is really is up to NASA to determine. We, we can't... Uh... You know, we, we can propose what we have seen uh, in mice. We have to do many more testing for sure, but it's up to NASA to really cap that. It's certainly uh, encouraging. Our, our data where actually I saw also a question, when was determined uh, the limit, the, when was determined the female were protected? Our data in 2018 were the first that, that showed that female were protected. And uh, where shortly after, several other investigators have also replicated uh, those mm -hmm. studies. But with this said, um, recently at the HRP meeting uh, that was in February, um, other groups uh, have shown, uh, Rich Britain, Katie Davidson, have shown that in female rats, uh, when they start to measure different uh, uh, cognitive tasks, different from learning and memory, more like an impulsivity and, uh, and more prefrontal cortex related, the female seemed more susceptible under certain circumstances, which suggested again that we need to give a really deeper look at what we're studying, translating from different uh, animal model, and, uh, and but, but the, the sex dimorphism has to be included in everything that we studied, for sure. Mm -hmm. How is the blended radiation, protons, helium, et cetera, generated for the experiments where animals are being irradiated? Uh, so this is all created at the Brookhaven National Laboratory where there are those accelerators. There are the physicists there, that they are in charge. We, don't, we go there. Uh, to help uh, to put the mice, but we don't touch those buttons. And, and so they calculated those, the, those rates. And, um, and so usually 
um, when we do this, the, we have done previously for, for a long time, uh, everybody would do like one ion at a time. And more recently, we have started to do those cocktails of ions. And so as I've shown uh, the slides, we would put them uh, uh, consequentially for those ions. And so what happens is usually it takes 30 to 40 minutes to switch ions, uh, but the mouse is in inside of a cage um, and is, is relatively safe and, and the ions transverse the whole, the whole body. I don't know if it's that, uh, but the ratio of the cocktail is calculated, first of all, based on what is uh, in deep space where protons are. Protons are about 90% of the deep space of the deep space radiation. And, uh, and then there is 8% of helium and the rest are all those high uh, energy particles. And so, so that's how they calculate. And they are all the physicists. I was absolutely fascinated by uh, your whole talk, but a couple of points, Dr. Razi. One is um, you talked about diet changes to get rid of the old microglial cells and then actually to induce new microglial cells. I think that on a dietary note would be fascinating to know what types of dietary interventions would do each of those. Uh, is that something that you're looking at as possibly a countermeasure as well? It is in clinical trials, actually, not for CNS disease, but for peripheral uh, inflammatory disease. Uh, wow. It's a, a, a plexicon compound that uh, um, actually target uh, a specific receptor, C CSF1 receptor, it is on the surface of microglia. Wow. And, uh, and so it basically caused the death of the microglia. And so you can deplete uh, fully the microglia with that. Uh, in, a, in a week, you, you deplete all the microglia. And so, and, and, but then uh, you don't touch the, the pool that is there, that a small pool of the, a niche of cells that are those that then repopulate the brain. And those that are repopulated are just newly born. They're fresh, they're nice, they've not been impacted. Uh, and so they, they are good. They're good to go. So the good is that, yes, there, there is no injection, is a diet uh, and is on clinical trials. It could be uh, possibly used uh, as a countermeasure for sure. But the question is, uh, and we have to answer that, uh, how many times, so let's say you are hit with solar particles, right? You know that and boom, you take this diet, you deplete the microglia, you get repopulated. Um, if another solar particle events happens, do you need to take the treatment again? Uh, or not, and so those are the things that I think we need the first to address uh, in preclinically with the, with the animal studies.